So good evening, everybody. Uh, good attendance this evening. People turned up nice and early. Um, so I think this is the 22nd in our webinar series. Uh, and this evening, we're going to be uh, focusing on the management of uh, a complex distal radius and carpal uh, injuries. Um, to uh, uh, to share his thoughts, we have um, uh, Ed Powell Smith, who is a consultant orthopedic hand and wrist surgeon um, from Harrogate up in Yorkshire, um, who uh, last autumn uh, spent three weeks uh, with UK Med uh, in Ukraine, um, and his uh, he, he doesn't have a massive military experience but he's certainly treated lots of uh, uh, wrist and carpal bone fractures. Uh, and his presentation uh, will be informed by uh, his experiences uh, work working uh, uh, mainly in Western Ukraine uh, last, uh, last autumn. Um, uh, Andre, do you wanna uh, do the Ukrainian bit? Yeah. <laughs> Отже, доброго вечора, шановні колеги. Раді вас бачити на нашому 22-му вебінарі, який ми проводимо сумісно з ФЕШ, Федерацією Європейських Асоціацій Хірургів Кісті, та BSSH, Британським Товариством Хірургів Кісті. Сьогодні ми послухаємо лекцію, що буде стосуватися складних внутрішньосугубових переломів зап'ястку, Переважно буде стосуватися дистального пінотафізу променевої кістки та проксимального ряду зап'ястку. Наш лектор Едвард Павел Сміс, він є хірургом кісті в Йоркширі. Він з місією UK Med провів кілька тижнів минулої осені в Вінниці. Сьогоднішня його лекція буде базуватися в основному на його досвід, який він отримав під час допомоги нашим пораненим, нашим бійцям. Отже, я думаю, що буде доволі цікаво. Чергово закликаю вас бути активними. Будь ласка, пишіть ваші запитання в чат або через форму питань та відповідей Q&A. Можете писати його українською мовою, якщо ви не встигаєте перекласти чи ще щось або ви ну, вважаєте, що можете неправильно перекласти, і я їх залюбки перекладу, і я сподіваюся на плідну і цікаву дискусію після сьогоднішньої лекції. Отже, раді вас всіх бачити, і, будь ласка, будьте активні. So, thank you very much, uh, and uh, Edward, I think the floor is yours. Please, you could you put your questions in the chat? Uh, and in the Q&A, ideally in the chat as usual. Um, and if you put them in uh, when you think of them, we'll deal with them at the end. Ed, please carry on. Lovely, thank you very much. Let me just see if I can get the screen share to work. Right, uh, so hopefully you can still hear me all. And... Hopefully you can see that. Okay. All good, yeah. Excellent. So as I say, my name's Ed Powell Smith. So I'm a consultant orthopedic hand and wrist surgeon. And so I'm gonna share with you some of my thoughts about the management of complex distal radius fractures and carpal injuries. Um, so what I'm planning to cover today. So we're gonna have a quick look at the normal anatomy of the wrist and carpus. Um, look and see what it is that we're trying to restore. Going to have a look at the common intraarticular fracture patterns and then strategies for reconstruction. We're also then going to have a look at some of the proximal row injuries in the carpus and again strategies for reconstruction in these injuries. What I'm not going to be covering I'm afraid is the soft tissue reconstruction for those patients with large areas of soft tissue loss uh, unfortunately, I'm not a plastic surgeon, and so that's outside of my area of expertise. So when we're looking at a normal wrist, 
what is it that we're trying to reconstruct when we come across a complex distal radius fracture and why? And effectively within the wrist, you've got a number of joints. So first of all, we're looking at the distal radio ulnar joint around here. And that I always think is the place to start when you're trying to reconstruct. We need to try and restore the radial height, the lunate fossa, scaphoid fossa, the radial inclination. On the lateral, you're looking at the volar tilt. And then within the joint surface itself, you're looking for the articular congruency in order to support the lunate and the scaphoid. So there's a lot to think about when you're often focused with a large amount of bone fragments and how you're going to put them back together. When you're looking at the fracture patterns, they often fall into a fairly similar pattern. So the work done by Lamb and Wolf shows it really quite nicely. You often have a larger ulnar corner fragment on the volar surface, the radial styloid fragment, the dorsal fragment is often in one or two pieces there. But the most important thing not to forget is this central fragment here, which is often quite punched down and needs to be restored. Otherwise, once you've finished, your lunate is going to sink back down into that uh, and cause ongoing problems. So when you're planning your fixation, you need to be thinking about the relationship these fragments have to each other in order to be able to restore the articular surface and then really start systematically to reduce each of those fragments and hold them as securely as possible. There is no one size fits all option when you're dealing with these. It's a case of constantly having to look at the fracture you've got in front of you and be adaptable even as you're fixing it, as you may need to look at plan B or possibly even plan C as you're going along. What is it that we're trying to avoid? Even in relatively simple looking fractures, here you can see there is a small fragment in the ulnar corner that's depressed. It's been fixed nicely and there's been good articular congruency brought back here. But unfortunately, that fragment hasn't been picked up in the fixation. And when the patient's returned, you can see that it's dropped down. The lunate now is impacting with the radius. And so we're going to have to think about, do we take the patient back to theatre? What are our options from here? And so these are the situations that we're trying to avoid. Surgical approach. I tend to, for the complex fractures, use a combined volar and dorsal approach. Occasionally, you need a little incision around the radial styloid as well. But more often than not, you can do it through volar and dorsal. There are a couple of things with the volar approach that I think really make a massive difference in terms of trying to get distal enough and into the ulnar corner. I use a straightforward FCR approach, so incision based over the top of the FCR tendon. But the critical bit is to make sure that you extend your incision distally enough, and I go almost all the way to the wrist crease. I sweep FDL off with a finger sweep, off pronator quadratus. And at that point, you can get a self-retaining retractor in, again, being careful of the median nerve and not to put too much pressure on it. And you'll see at the distal end of pronator quadratus, there's an area of fat that sits over the top of it. And one of the critical things is to lift that area of fat, both radially and ulnarwards, to expose the whole of pronator quadratus before you incise it and lift it off the distal radius. By doing that, it will allow you to get distal enough for these really distal fractures so that you can see right up to the watershed line. You can then anatomically reduce your fragments under direct vision. If there's a radial styloid fragment, I will usually release brachioradialis. And again, when you look in the literature, there are a number of ways that you can do that. Some people use a little Z lengthening but I prefer just to take a knife up the inside of brachioradialis and lift it off the radial styloid fragment, and then I let it sit where it is. I've not had any problems afterwards with people complaining with, with long-term problems, and it tends to just sit back down into its new position without any problems. I would normally take FCR in an ulnarward direction to protect the nerve, but again, if you've got a very small, 
own a, own a corner fragment, you can then come down on the ulnar side of FCR, taking it radially for a short amount of time. A little Hohmann's retractor just proximal to the distal radial ulnar joint can then be used to retract the median nerve carefully out of the way and give you really good access into that ulnar corner. So I'm going to talk about a number of cases as we go through and just show you what my decision making in is as it goes on from there. So the first case I'm going to use is this one here. So we've got distal fracture. There's a dorsal fragment there, volar fragment there, and you can see once it was reduced into a plaster, sorry, apologies, volar fragment there, once it was reduced into the plaster, you can see there's something sat in this point here and a very small radial styloid fragment. It's useful to get extra imaging if you can. We've got a CT scan and you can see on the volar aspect, this is the articular surface from the central portion here. The dorsal cortex is pretty much obliterated. And again, the radial styloid fragment is very, very small. Given the lack of dorsal cortex at this point, my plan was to go through a volar aspect, try and reduce this and pack any bone graft in that needs to go behind it. You can see interoperative films, so using a small Volkman spoon to reduce that surface, that articular surface back underneath the scaphoid fossa. Once it was reduced, held with a temporary K wire. And then these little hook plates can be really, really useful with the hook just going over the edge to hold the fragments back. If they're unavailable, you can use something like a small fragment plate. If you cut through a hole, then you can use the two hooks to then, or to create two hooks to go right over the watershed line and down into the other side. The most important bit here is restoration of that central big articular component. Once you've secured the ulnar corner, you can then use plates at 90 degrees to each other, which is a really nice, strong, stable construct to hold that radial styloid fragment back on. But also the screws here are forming a raft underneath that central fragment to stop it from dropping back into the void that sat behind it. In this particular case, once that was done, it was stable. And so there was no need to come and try and do anything with the, with the dorsal aspect here. So it was a question of just simply keeping it from there. I try and get the patients moving as quickly as I can afterwards. I often put them into a temporary cast for about a week before bringing them out with early movement for two main reasons. Firstly, they're going to get really stiff due to the intra-articular component. But secondary, uh, secondly, with the early movement, you're using your lunate and your scaphoid just to help gently recontour, uh, particularly where you've got fragments you may not have a complete hold of. They can just help to contour them in as, uh, as they heal in the right position. So, Looking at a slightly different case, we've got similar fracture pattern here, although much more highly commutated. You can see the fracture extends here into the distal radial ulnar joint. We've got an intra-articular split with a separate radial styloid fragment. And again, looking at the lateral, there's a small volar fragment, a small dorsal fragment, and it's difficult to see what's happening in the central bit here, but you can see there is a split in the articular surface. So already I'm thinking at this point, we're going to need to use column method for fixation. So to secure firstly the ulnar corner, then the radial styloid, and then have a look and see what's happening with the back. Again, if you can get more imaging, it's always very useful. And a CT scan showing similar fractures to the lamb and wolf, uh, similar fracture pattern to those shown in the lamb and wolf uh, article. So we've got the ulnar corner fragment, radial styloid fragment with some dorsal comminution in it there. And then we've got the dorsal fragment that's split into two bits. And then 
the large central articular fragment there, which again is significantly depressed down. So when you're looking at something like this, it's a question of, again, slowly trying to piece these bits of the jigsaw puzzle back together in a logical fashion. I always like to start distal radial ulnar joint and see if you can secure that and secure the ulnar column first. So in theater, reducing, making sure you've got articular congruency and then holding with a temporary K wire put in through the volar aspect. You can put the wire in through the tip of the fragment to hold it in place. I used to originally fix the volar fragment with the wire, then wire the radial styloid fragment in before I did any definitive fixation. I find that by the time you've secured this ulnar, ulnar corner fragment here, the radial styloid would usually have come loose. And so now I concentrate on the ulnar styloid, I'll show you on the ulnar corner. We fix that into place with a small plate and then reduce the radial styloid on and hold that in place from there. So secure on the ulnar corner, then reduce and wire the radial styloid. The radial styloid plate here is a little bit more proximal due to the comminution in the radial styloid, particularly around the dorsal side in order to try and get the fixation there. So you, again, you've got to be adaptable to where your fracture pattern is, but all the time looking at the articular surface across to make sure that that's been adequately reduced. When you're using these ulnar column plates and they're coming really very distal, you have to be very careful about the screw length here. And you can see that on the lateral, if you put the screws too long, they're gonna come straight through the joint surface there. Once you've secured radial styloid and ulnar column, I then make a separate dorsal incision. I come through the third dorsal compartment and then lift the second and the fourth off the back of the, off the, back of the radius to expose. You often find the dorsal cortex of the radius is extremely thin and highly comminuted, which is useful for some things, but also it means it's very difficult to then get it reduced adequately. It's useful in that you can then lift that dorsal cortex in order to restore this articular component here. And if you'll excuse my line drawings, this is what I aim to do. So once I've stabilized this volar cortex, I'll then lift the dorsal cortex you can get a tool such as a freer or a little um, punch in to carefully push back that central articular component and then pack some bone graft behind as needed. You can then reduce this dorsal cortex and then hold that with a plate really just as a buttress across the top. The thing you want to be most careful about that's really easy to do, and it's because this dorsal cortex is so thin and friable, it's very easy to not line it up at this point. And if you don't line it up, when you compress it down, you end up with a big step in the articular surface here that's then going to impinge on your lunate. So the critical thing is to make sure that you get this back far enough to restore a nice smooth articular surface at that point. So that's the same patient, eight weeks down the line, managed to maintain articular surface on both sides. Usefully, you can't see the articular surface through the AP because I've hidden it behind metalwork, but functionally, they're doing all right. So looking at the next case, you always have to have a plan B. So what happens if when you get in there, you find that you're fragments are too distal in order to be able to fix or even beforehand if you're looking at a case like this so this is pre-manipulation immediate post-injury which is across here you can see that the fracture is extremely distal there's highly a highly comminuted dorsal fragment and once it's reduced the radial styloid is again 
multi-fragmentary, very difficult to, again, it's going to be very difficult to get any form of fixation into that. It's also going to be very difficult to get any sort of form of fixation into this fragment as we're right up to the watershed line. And again, you can see here, there's just a tiny little bit of volar cortex there in order to be able to reduce it into. So technically, this is going to be really challenging to try and reduce and fix. So we've therefore got to think about what are the other options that we've got. We can treat it on a plaster. Trying to get control in a cast for this is going to be, again, difficult. We can treat it in an external fixator, but we know that with an external fixation for these, unless you're very careful about where you put your pin sites in, we can run into trouble with long-term infection, uh, either in the bone or tethering around the tendons. The alternative option is using a bridging plate. You can put something like this in without opening the fracture site at all. You make a little incision over the middle metacarpal, little incision for further proximally over the radius and slide the plate in. And it's one of those descriptions where I always think sliding a plate in here, it's never gonna go. But if you put it underneath the fourth, the fourth dorsal compartment, actually it slides in extremely easily to sit right over the dorsal cortex uh, of the radius here. You can then attach it into the metacarpal distally through a slotted screw onto the, onto the radius. You can start to attach it and then apply your longitudinal traction and then secure it in using capsular desis to reduce all of these fragments within, uh, within the fracture. The plate then sits under the skin, so we're then able to leave it in for three or four months before taking it out, again, just through small incision over the index finger metacarpal and a small incision over the radius and sliding it out through the same fracture, or sorry, through the same wounds from there. You can see there is a small step in the articular surface here, but I think given the initial fracture, fracture fragments that we had, the outcome was probably better than I could have hoped to have achieved with straightforward fixation in situ. I'm going to talk a little bit now about carpal injuries around the proximal row, and again, my approach to fixing these ones. So let's start with carpal dislocation in relation to a distal radius injury. I'm going to talk a little bit about perilunate and lunate dislocations, and then transcaphoid perilunate injuries. And again, my approach to fixation of those. So with carpal dislocation, we're looking at a case like this, really. So we've got a full carpal dislocation off the end of the distal radius. So this was a forced hyperextension injury. So in a young man with an extremely heavy weight, similar sort of fracture patterns that you'd see in an RTA with a forced hyperextension through the steering wheel or a fall from a big height. You can see that the whole proximal row is dislocated out of the radius. And on, again, on the CT scan, you can see certainly there's an absence of any carpus seen within the scaphoid and lunate fossas, and the lunate is sitting on a volar direction. This type of injury is more of a distal radius fracture rather than a true carpal dislocation. And you can see the small fragments here, and you need to treat it more as, again, a distal radius fracture. The reduction is relatively straightforward fixing the small fragment back in with the capsule attached, then has stability. And again, the use of a little hook plate to hold that fragment back in, you can see you've got immediate stability in order to be able to get the patient moving again straight away. The movement is really key because there's going to be a big dorsal and volar capsular injury. And if you don't get them moving, then as that scars, it's going to tighten up. And as it tightens up, you're going to end up with an extremely stiff and painful wrist. So you want to aim to try and get fixation with as much stability as you can in order to be able to get them moving as early as possible. 
when you're looking at either perilunate or lunate dislocations, the difference really is with a perilunate dislocation, the lunate would remain in the lunate fossa and the carpus dislocates off it. With a lunate dislocation, the alignment of the carpus remains, but the lunate dislocates out of the front. The sequence of events as it occurs, you get firstly disruption of the scapha lunate ligament, then you get disruption of the capito lunate uh, articulation, then the lunotriquetral articulation, then you get failure of the dorsal radiocarpal ligament, and the lunate then rotates out in order to uh, dislocate out of the whole process. And that's now sitting, really pushing on the median nerve, which makes this an important one not to miss. You can see for the untrained eye, it's relatively straightforward to miss. You often the only thing that's picked up is the little radial styloid fracture here. But if you see a radial styloid or an ulnar styloid fracture in isolation, you should have a high index of suspicion for a greater arc injury coming through the lunotriquetral and scapholunate ligament areas. Initial treatment needs to be a closed reduction. With adequate analgesia, if caught early enough, you can reduce it. The reduction mechanism is by hyperextending the radius, reducing the, reducing the lunate, and so with thumb pressure over the top of the media, uh, over the top of the lunate, and then bringing the wrist from hyperextension with traction into flexion, in order to try and get it to reduce in. If it's going to go, you'll feel it with a nice click or a clunk as it drops back into place. These injuries often occur in young, fit men. If there's a high muscle mass, it may well be that you're going to need a general anaesthetic in order to be able to relax the patient enough to be able to put it back in. If you can't reduce it, you then need to, uh, oh, sorry, if you can't reduce it closed, an extended carpal tunnel approach will find the lunate just sitting right in the carpal tunnel there. You can then either get uh, something like a, a McDonald or a Freer retractor in order to just gently lever the capitate up and then push the lunate back in from there to reduce it. Once the lunate is reduced, you've then taken the pressure off the median nerve. And by taking the pressure off the median nerve, you've then got a little bit of time in order to be able to, to then definitively fix. You're then looking at secondary treatment and definitive fixation. So as we know with these injuries, you've got disruption of the dorsal capsule, the scapholunate ligament, and the lunotriquetral ligament. The main scapholunate ligament is on the dorsum, the main lunotriquetral uh, luno ligament is on the volar aspect. So again, you're looking at a combined approach through dorsal and volar aspects in order to be able to repair both ligaments. So for the dorsal approach, again, I come through the third dorsal compartment. So releasing EPL from behind Lister's tubercle and then lifting the second and the fourth compartment off in order to expose the dorsal capsule. Once you can see the dorsal capsule, there is always a rent that sits right over the top of the scapholunate ligament. If you remember the fourth uh, stage of scapholunate ligament, um, sorry, the fourth stage of lunate dislocation is disruption of the dorsal artic, uh, dorsal cord, sorry, excuse me, is disruption of the dorsal capsule. And so that's where the rent is. And the rent sits directly over this area here. And it's one of those things that is always there. So through the rent, you can then make sure that you've reduced your lunate and your scaphoid adequately. And then you want to hold scaphoid into, scaphoid into lunate and scaphoid into capitate to maintain that congruency there. Then with a small anchor, you can place the anchor into the lunate and fix the ligament back across under direct vision from that. You then want to go into the volar aspect. Again, an extended carpal tunnel 
you can then carefully retract the median nerve radially. So along with all of the flexor tendons. And again, you'll see a sort of lunate, so a, a crescent moon-shaped rent sitting directly between the lunate and the triquetrum. Through that, you can ensure that you've reduced your lunate and triquetral joint adequately, and then fix that with K wires. There's some thoughts that you don't need to do a direct lunotriquetral ligament repair as long as the ligament is sitting where it should be. It's one of those areas where I'm sure you don't need to do it, but if you're checking to see if the ligament is sat there, then I see there's no harm in putting an anchor again into the triquetrum and fixing it back. And then you know that it's going to be secure and you're not going to run into any problems in the long term. Transscaphoid lunate dislocations adds a new dimension of complexity into these injuries. With these, you can see a fracture in the scaphoid, lunate is fully dislocated. So this is a lunate dislocation and the carpus is aligned and the lunate is sitting out through the volar aspect. Emergency management needs to be similar to a straightforward lunate dislocation in that you need to ensure that you take the pressure off the median nerve by reducing the lunate. Once you've got the pressure off the median nerve, again, you've got some time, although cert definitive surgery should be expedited because there is significant risk to the proximal pole of the scaphoid and the vascularity there. Secondary imaging can be helpful. You can see here that this is the proximal pole of the scaphoid and it's actually rotated through 180 degrees to be pointing in the wrong direction. So here's the proximal pole which should be sat the other way within the scaphoid fossa. So we know that with this there's going to be significant risk to the vascularity of this, of, of this proximal pole and therefore an expedient reduction and fixation will give it the best possible chance uh, of uniting. Although I suspect with a case like this, we are going to be looking at salvage surgery later, but if we can buy him a number of years with which his risk can function on that, that's got to be a good thing. So again, definitive surgery, you're looking at a dorsal approach. Dorsal approach through the third dorsal compartment, finding that fragment and rotating it back. And before you can do anything else, you need to stabilize the scaphoid so that it's all then moving as one piece. You can imagine with disruption to the scaphoid lunate, in, uh, scaphoid lunate ligament, fracture of the scaphoid, disruption of the lunotriquetral ligament, disruption of the dorsal cortex, the whole thing is extremely unstable. And so you need to reduce the fragment temporary wire across or two wires in order to be able to do it and then fix definitively with a screw brace from proximal to distal to give it some stability. Once you've stabilized the fragments in the scaphoid, you then want to have a similar approach of stabilizing the scaphoid against the lunate, stabilizing the triquetrum into the hamate and the lunate on this one, and then fixing the ligaments with an anchor again into both bones in order to be able to reduce and restore the normal anatomy. Post-op, you have no choice with these but to immobilize them properly. They need to be in a cast for at least six weeks. So I cut my wires short and bury them because otherwise there's an increased risk of infection. At six weeks, you want to remove the wires and I'm mobilized with a resting splint. Physio to start range of motion almost immediately out of cast, but strengthening not to start until eight weeks post-op. So it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour, I'm, a please, I'm afraid, but hopefully there's been some useful information there. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
Thank you, Edward, for this interesting uh, talk and these uh, tips and tricks of how to manage uh, this really difficult uh, distal radius and uh, carpal injuries. Uh, we already have a few uh, questions. Uh, some of them are uh, Jonathan uh, right about them, but uh, maybe you can add something. Uh, the questions refer to case two. Uh, do you do arthrotomy to make sure your joint surface is reduced under a side? Yeah, so uh, it's it's a it's a good question. So often you find in in these cases where the um, uh, they're highly multifragmentary and very distal that the capsule has already come off. One of the little plates I use has some little uh, suture holes in the end, so that you can then suture the capsule back on at the end which can add to the secondary stability. So you can often see the joint surface, particularly if you're going volar and dorsal, but I have the luxury, I have a mini C-arm, and so I can use the, the mini C-arm in order to make sure that we've got that articular congruency again. With that, when you're lifting, so when you're coming back in through the dorsal cortex and lifting that dorsal cortex up, in order to gently restore and push down the articular surface. You can often see at that stage exactly where the congruency is. I don't like using arthroscopy for this because I think the arthroscopy fluid, so first of all, you're never gonna get that to stay within the joint. And I'm always worried about creating more iatrogenic damage to the joint surfaces by putting a scope in. So I think using x-ray and through the capsulotomies that are already there to be honest you can see enough of the articular surface to be able to reduce it as close to anatomically as possible the other thing is is that once you think that you've got that particularly that central fragment back in the right position then by flexing and extending the wrist the lunate will then push into that and actually that can really help to get a nice congruent surface as you then compress your dorsal fragment back in. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, on that theme, if you have a lot of dorsal comminution, you have to be quite careful about stripping the periosteum uh, in that often the periosteum is the only thing holding it all together. Yeah. Um, so uh, you can, particularly if you can use something like a pie plate, um, actually put the plate extra periosteally. If you do that, you do then almost always have to remove it, but it acts as a buttress. And usually if you need to go dorsal, uh, there are a lot of small fragments. Um, I don't use arthroscopy uh, anymore, uh, but on the rare occasions that I, uh, I'm tempted to, you can either do it dry um because all you need to do is see that you, do, you don't need a full diagnostic arthroscopy of the wrist you're just trying to see the fracture fragments or the other thing is if you do it wet if you put a big syringe in a 20 mil syringe with a white needle you can pull the fluid through so instead of having a high pressure um so i think if you've got a lot of work to do arthroscopy makes it take longer and probably it really isn't worth uh, the effort uh, but but if you do choose to do it don't put high pressure fluid in because the whole wrist swells up and you can't see anything <clears throat> i would agree i would echo those thoughts uh the next question is about uh all distal ulna stability uh, uh do you check it uh, and what do you do with it absolutely check it sorry i should have i should have mentioned that before so I think, it's, I think it's really important to check. So these injuries, they often, as we said, have a lot of capsular injury as well. So at the end of the case, I'll always put them into like the arm wrestle position, check in neutral, full pronation, full supination as well, and make sure it's stable. The majority of the time, if you've got your columns aligned, and that's why I particularly start with the ulnar corner, 
I mean, that's your most critical column. You've got the alignment of the distal radial ulnar joint. You've got good stability there that you find that you get a secondary stability. If you're in doubt, then I would fix, or if it is grossly unstable, then tend to K-wire from the ulnar head across, but you then have to keep them in a plaster for certainly at least four weeks before you can start to get them going. So there is going to be a lot of secondary stiffness as a result of that. Trying to do a primary TFCC repair is often quite thankless. It's quite challenging to find the remnants of the TFCC and get that pulled back down into the uh, ulnar, uh, into the ulnar head. Um, and often you can over tighten it and then you end up with again difficulty with pronation and supination. So I find reducing it, stabilizing it, and then letting it knit together naturally with scar tissue is the most effective way of doing it. Thank you. Jonathan, any tips? Jonathan, you're, you're muted. You're muted Jonathan. There's quite a lot of evidence to support that most ulnar styloid fractures don't require fixation. Because yeah. although in a complex fracture, the TFCC and ulnar styloid will always be disrupted because uh, you can't get the displacement without disrupting it. As long as you restore the uh, radial anatomy and retension the interosseous membrane, the interosseous membrane will usually provide sufficient stability. If you leave a big uh, translation uh, of the radius and detension the interosseous membrane, then you may uh, have more trouble. Um, I've always said that ulnar head fractures should always be fixed. But I, I think, with, particularly if the ulnar head is a complex fracture, um, uh, in an older patient, it can be very difficult to get adequate fixation. And with the um, very stable fixation of the radius that you can get, with modern implant, modern locking implants, uh, you can actually get away with leaving the ulnar head to uh, to, to sort of uh, find its own balance. And they usually unite, um, but ulnar styloid fractures can almost always be left. Thank you. So the next question about. Uh... About force compartment and about how to put uh, your plate. Do you put it under and uh, just mobilize it superiorly, or you open it up and put it over the periosteum? So for for the bridging plate, so the bridging plate goes over the periosteum, so it just goes under the fourth compartment, and you slide it from the index finger metacarpal and then slide it under the fourth compartment, but over the top of over the top of the capsule and the periosteum. So you're minimally invasive in order to just, you're literally just using traction and capsular and the capsular desis just to pull everything back together uh, from there. And it can be really very effective for those fractures that often look unreconstructable in order to, to put, um, tension on traction on and then just sit and leave it for for three or four months and come back and take take your plate out and it can be a really it's a good get out of jail card for those where you you've either looked at it or you really don't know what you're going to do it can be really very useful and although the you yeah, know the plates aren't available everywhere and I'm aware that there are supply issues in Ukraine at the moment as well. So there are other things that you can use to get a similar type of fixation. So you know, the fibular plates um, can be useful. So the, you can put the distal end of the fibular plate over the metacarpal, the proximal end on the radius. Um, so, or even in desperation, you could use a, a recon plate, which you can contour, although the screws are a little big in the metacarpal. Mm. So you just have to be careful with that. Um, but it, but it's certainly an option for, you know, where there are no other options. It, it, it sits in the compartment under the retinaculum and it must sit yeah. under the tendons. In yeah, the fourth, absolutely. you don't normally have to release the retinaculum. No. If you put it in the second compartment, which you can, then you do uh, usually have to release the ret retinaculum. I put in the chat 
um, uh, an, a description of the Optech from Doug Hamill, who first described the technique. Um, it, it, the, the other situation which can be helpful is it, it, if you haven't got time. So if somebody's got multiple injuries or you've got lots of people to deal with and you can't spend two hours or two and a half hours reconstructing a wrist, uh, the results are surprisingly good. As Ed said, you need to leave the plate in probably for two or three months. Yeah. Um, and it was originally described with a three point, a, a small fragment, 3.5 millimeter plate. But if you're going to do that, that you have to put the screws right in the center of the metacarpal. Um, and the, the distal screw, I would usually put a unicortical screw to reduce the risk of fracturing the metacarpal. Um, but it, it, it does work with bigger plates. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, one technical uh, question about the di diameter of the wires that you use to fix uh, the carpal for temporary and for maybe sometimes final fixation. Uh, so either 1.4 millimeter or 1.6 milli 1.6 millimeter, depending on on size of patient, really. Um, and uh, but yeah, so usually 1.4 millimeter are enough. Uh, particularly if you're trying to get two wires into each side. Otherwise, you find that if you're trying to get 1.6 in there, they're, they're a bit big. Small, small wires are likely to break, which is a disaster. Yeah. Um, the other thing is it they're sometimes not that easy to put in. So I would often put the wires in before I reduce the... Um, before I reduce the dislocation. So you can put them through the scaphoid before you reduce the scaphoid uh, to the uh, to the lunate. So in that case, you know you've got it in the right place. Because um, if you do multiple passes, uh, you, you blunt the wires, you get heating, uh, you upset the skin, you upset the, the, the branches of the superficial radial nerve. Um, so uh, the... The wires are not as easy as you would hope, but they're important. Thank you very much. Um, question about just maybe a few words or a little simple algorithm uh, about uh, when do or when do not uh, to fix uh, the ulnar styloid for this uh, multifragmentary complex uh, distal radius fractures. I think as as Jonathan's already alluded to. So for just the styloid fractures, there, there is no real indication to, to fix them. So providing you've got your radial height back uh, and the tension in the interosseous membrane, then there's no real indication to fix the ulnar styloid fractures. Occasionally you see people back with some pain for, around from a, a, an ulnar styloid non-union, but it's pretty unusual to be honest. Um, and in those rare cases, you can often excise the fragment at a later date. That gets rid of the pain and the problems, but it doesn't increase the stability if you've got your radial height back to where it should be. If you do have a problem with instability, you would usually find that if you put them in uh, supination, that helps with the stability. So, I mean, you can put a wire across, but you have problems with stiffness, the wire can break. Um, and often if you just put them in an above elbow for a couple of weeks in some supination, things start to scar up and instability. If you fix the radius correctly, instability is a really rare problem. If you have a distal radius malunion then, and the sigmoid notch is not uh, correctly aligned, then you are much more likely to have a problem. And I think that that's why it's the, the crucial bit of your fixation is that ulnar column, because your height comes from that and your sigmoid notch. And so that's the really critical fragment to get reduced first. Make sure you're absolutely happy with it. Fix it in place and then you can build the rest of your distal radius around it. It's normally a nice big fragment too. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, with, very rare yeah. that the volar ulnar corner uh is is comminuted unless it's a rim fracture yeah 
and there's also you've got a nice thick cortex so you can often get good hold into it as well thank you very much one of our attendees uh, asked when treating a waller part of a perilonate dislocation i find it hard to orient myself and do a proper uh, ele evaluation finding working space do you have any tips uh, on approach part uh, apart from extending the incision yeah so i think you need a you need a decent sized incision so i would um you know, normally come from about as distal as you can get, come across the palmar crease uh, up to about the, this level. So you're looking at a, a good size incision from there. That allows you good access into, you know, so you can see clearly your median nerve, you can see clearly your flexor tendons. Uh, as you come across the, the wrist crease, you just want to zigzag your incision a little bit so that you don't have a straight line coming across the crease. It is no doubt, yeah, there is no doubt about it, it is nerve wracking, mobilizing all of that content, but you can gently sweep it radially. And by sweeping it radially, you can then quietly get down into the bottom, but just take your time to do it. Careful, slowly, use your assistant to help you retract with a, a large sort of saddle retractor or something along those lines in order just to gently bring the contents out without putting undue pressure on the median nerve. And as you do that, you'll then see that sort of, yeah, half moon shaped rent in the articular surface. Oh, sorry, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the capsule that you can then see through into the Nuno triquetral. Be, be aware of the palmar branch of the median nerve, because if you yeah. cut that, um, uh, it it makes the patients unhappy. It it causes yeah. them pain, numbness, and they're more likely to get CRPS. CRPS is pretty pretty unusual with fixation of uh, distal radius fractures. If you fix them well and and uh, get them moving without tight dressing. Yeah, I, I agree. It's not something that we commonly have problems with. I think if you've got access to regional anesthesia as well. So using blocks rather than general anesthetic, then that also decreases the risk of um, CRPS as well. Um, but it's, it's not overly tightening your dressing. So making sure you're laying your bandages on rather than pulling them tight as it goes. Lots of elevation, early movement, uh, and things will settle from there. There's a question, distal radius and ulnar fractures, which one to reduce and fix first, Ed? I think I know so that's answer. a good question. Um, so again, I would normally try and fix the, the radius first and then I'd fix the ulna so that I can ensure it's con congruent into, uh, into the sigmoid notch. But I, I'll be honest, I, I find that fixing the distal ulnar fractures is, is not as straightforward as it would appear. Often the bone quality is, is poor, it's difficult to get fixation, um, and it's always, I'm, I'm never surprised by how challenging it is to get good quality on a fixation. Maybe that's just me as a surgeon, but I think, you know, I don't enter into it lightly. I take my time in order to get it right. Um, EPL rupture rates. EPL is most commonly ruptured in undisplaced fractures. Um, if it ruptures following fixation, you've either put an osteotome through it, trying to mobilize the fracture, yeah, uh, or, or you've drill. put a drill or a screw through it, yeah. um, which you, you, as long as you're careful, the risk of that should be very low. Mm. The, with volar plate fixation, the tendons that rupture most often is actually FPL and FDS to the index. Um, and plate positioning is critical to that. So you must put the plate flush on the bone. Uh, if you leave the plate standing off the bone, then you can cause a problem. And if you leave the screw heads prominent, they, they, they also can cause tendon ruptures. And I always put a non-locking screw in first in order to make sure that the bone and the plate come together. You, you can then replace it with a locking screw in many systems if you need to. But if you, if you start with a locking screw in the distal row, you risk standing the plate off the bone and causing, if, if the LP, FPL ruptures, that's much more of a problem than EPL. It's much harder to reconstruct and it's more important. 
I'm only talking about that we don't have any blackouts in here and here and here we go. <laughs> we the electricity goes off. <laughs> so, um, okay, we have one question from uh, our colleague from Ukraine. Do you use ligament taxes uh, for the neglected cases? Maybe. Uh, put some X fix and try to uh, apply some traction before you go in for this uh, for uh, big dispra- displacements. Is is that for carpal injuries or for, for the distal radius fractures? For um, both, maybe for uh, for uh, carpal dis, uh, displacements and uh, in some ca- cases for distal radius so i think the 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 longest neglect i've had in a carpal dislocation injury has been about six weeks and we were able to reduce it open without any additional ligament axis or 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 traction uh, but just using gentle manipulation um, uh, uh, and carefully manipulating the the capitate off and into into the lunate fossa um, so it's not something I've, I've had to use previously and actually have no experience with using ex- external fixation prior to. If you have a really late presentation of a perilunate, um, a proximal row carpectomy can be a good solution if the tissues are too tight to allow you to uh, reduce it. Uh, I hate external fixators in the radius because it, it, as you put the tension on, what ends up happening is, is you get a stiff hand uh, and it's very easy to get CRPS with an X-fix and it's very easy to get a stiff hand. And it, it, if they injure their wrist, they get a stiff wrist. That's not a disaster. But if they injure their wrist and they get a stiff hand when they haven't injured the hand, um, I, I think that, that's bad management. It, if you have late fracture presentation which we actually quite often do in our third world healthcare system of the nhs and you you often find you're trying to do complex fractures at three weeks and four weeks if you mobilize the dorsal periosteum that and release the brachioradialis as ed has said uh, that that will help you to 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 reduce the the fractures if you've got um a partly united intra-articular fracture that that's more difficult. But if it's an extra, mainly an extra articular fracture, it's all about mobilizing the periosteum. Um, it's, it's, it's the Orbe approach. If you look at um, George Orbe's description through a volar approach, you can uh, release the bra- brachioradialis and get over the back and release the dorsal periosteum. And if you do that, everything starts to move more easily. Let me see. There's a question about conservative management with a cast. You can do that, but for a complex fracture, you're probably better. Uh, and let, if, you, if, you've got, if you've lost a lot of soft tissue, then X fixes obviously are, are safer than plates. But it, assuming you can get some reasonable soft tissue cover and it's clean, uh, I, I would always tend to favor a, a spanning or a bridging plate because they're so easy to do and the results are so good. Um, uh, I, I prefer them to X fixes. I prefer them; they they work really well. And there's a there's an increasing literature to support that. I really completely agree. And uh, sorry, I only have seen now use X fix in polytrauma patient that you you have to fix everything, but ten days, then you have to to do something else. Ed, do you use special views to check screw length? Yeah, sorry. Do you use sure. special views to check screw length? Not, not normally. I'll be honest. I measure twice, uh, so I'm pretty belligerent, and particularly when I'm training about not over drilling, uh, particularly if going from the volar to the to the dorsal mm-hmm. side because of the risk to the. Um, extensor tendons, uh, 
So the things that I'm uh, absolutely, you have to have a, a sharp drill, no pressure and listening as, as you drill through. Um, so those are really critical. And then measuring twice um, in order to make sure. But no, I don't tend to use any special views particularly. You can, you try and do a, a, a shoot through like that in order to have a look and see, but I don't find it particularly helpful. I think they're difficult to interpret. May I ask you? Go on. Sorry, Go on. Jonathan. Go on. If you have a different system of uh, internal fixation, so different options or only one. Oh, for, for me? Yeah. So, I, so I, I have two different systems that I can use, but each has a, a variety of different fragment-specific plates. So I'm very spoiled in that I can choose my fixation system depending on the fracture the configuration. Fracture. Yeah. I, I have synthes and modatis. They, they all have strengths and weaknesses. Um, variable angle locking screws are very helpful um, in that it allows you to pick up the... the the individual fragments and avoid fracture lines. The, the other thing it allows you to do is it, it means that plate position is slightly less critical. If you only have fixed angle screws, the plate has to be perfectly positioned or you put the screws in the joint. Um, in terms of the screws, the, the one time that if, if there's dorsal uh, fragmentation, you're trying to uh manage it from a vola plate then sometimes you have to pick up the dorsal cortex with the screws and then screw length is really important yeah um uh, alternatively you can you can plate vola and dorsal but i avoid that when i can uh interop 3d diagnostic for c3 type fractures <laughs> I mean, I think as Ed said, if if you take if you're careful with your X-ray and take oblique views, normally you know you you can get a pretty good idea whether you've got it reduced or not. Yeah. And ligament taxis from a volar, if you're putting the plate on the volar side, ligament taxis is really important in terms of reducing the dorsal fragments. Uh, so I tend to re I I tend to pull on the wrist and let the assistant put the screws in. Um, yeah, no, so I think that's the you want the most experienced surgeon putting the traction on. You can always use some digital pressure across the back as well. Yeah, you can feel the dorsal cortex, and so you can put traction on, almost push whilst your whilst your assistant is the one who puts the screws in from there, and just holding it still. And if they drill it into your finger, the screw's too long. Um, <laughs> it, the the other thing is it. I don't think I've ever used a longer screw than a 26 and no. 24 is uh, it, it, 22 or 24. It tends to be quite a good length. So you do, you do get a feel for what screw length is appropriate. Yeah. I've just seen a, a, a question coming up saying, do you put screws in, in both rows of both distal rows of the plate? And the teaching I always had was uh, I've never met anybody who's regretted putting in too many screws, but plenty of people who have regretted putting in too few. So I think if you think it's going to add stability to your construct, you should use it. Um, you know, there are some holes that are put in for very specific fractures, but um, yeah, I think yeah, the, the questions just come up, what about the costs? Well, the cost of redoing it or the cost of the fracture collapsing is going to be much higher than the cost of an extra two screws. The, the other thing you tend to find, ooh, if I can, ooh. no, it's blurring. You. Oh, you probably yeah, can't see it. that. But the, the, the screws close to the joint and the screws away from the joint go at separate angles. Yeah. And where you get screws at different angles, it, it dramatically improves the hold in the bone. Yeah. Um, so one or two screws in, in the proximal row uh, is often helpful, particularly for the styloid. 
because you may, if there's a small fragment, you may only get one distal screw into the styloid. So a proximal screw will really help you there. Yeah. How are we doing, Andre? I think we've probably exhausted the Q&A. Um, are you in a position yes. that you can uh, show us a case or uh, is that not possible with the power down? Uh, I, I will try. <laughs> I still have my internet on my mobile, but without the video because you don't, <laughs> you will not see anything because <laughs> the light is shut. So, but just with my voice. So share screen and here we go. Do you see my slides? Uh, Can you see yet. my slides? No. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, a uh, young man, a uh, soldier uh, that uh, have a shrapnel injury of his wrist uh, near the Bakhmut a few months ago, something about three or four months ago. Uh, this is his X-rays uh, just after the injury with this uh, piece of shrapnel in his carpal bones. So um, then the surgeon took off uh, this piece of sharpness and make a CT scan. We see completely um, disorganized and fractured uh, nate uh, bone and um, sorry. Oh. Do you, do you hear me? Yes, <laughs> I will hear you. again. Here again. Sorry for Don't worry. some technical problem. Um, here we go. Yes. So uh, you can see, see this uh, CT completely fractured uh, uh, lunate and the fracture of the uh, capitate uh, bone. Um, after this, uh, he goes for the another debridement and one of the surgeons uh, take off uh, all the remnants of the lunate bone and uh, just with, uh, and then the uh, wound is healed and he goes to our hospital with uh, uh, such kind of X-ray um this kind of uh, clinic picture with uh, movements uh, that are very painful and not range of movements and uh, wrist also a very painful uh, finger movements because he feel the pain in his wrist uh, How long down uh, the track uh, is he? No. You... How many months? Uh, something about three months. Okay. After the injury. And no median nerve injury? No median injury. No, uh, he feels all, all, all of his fingers have the sensitivity, uh, even though ten injuries, full extension uh, of the fingers. So that's an interesting thing first, uh, that goes to mind when you see this uh, X-ray, that Thompson is born with this X-ray, this complete disruption of all three G lines. And uh, we see the scaphoid, uh, there's no uh, lunate, and uh, there is this is the head of capitate that are uh, rotated, and this is the other uh, fragment of the capital bone. So uh, we go. We open it up, we uh, go for uh, an STT fusion with some kind of procedure. 
we uh, try to put the the head of the uh, capitate bone and align it with the scaphoid, uh, extend the scaphoid bone, and a lot of uh, bone graft and fix all with the uh, key wires. And of course, the regeneration. So uh, for now, he is still with his key wire, so we don't uh, try to uh, mobilize it right now. But we uh, think to take off this uh, wires about six or eight weeks after the surgery and then uh, try to last wrist a little bit. Then maybe after a month, uh, send him to our uh, physiotherapist. Uh, and try to uh, work with this wrist. Good. Ed, your thoughts? So I think it's a, as always, complex complex case with this. We've got a, a capitate non-union and an absent lunate. Um, my initial thoughts were to probably try and get the capitate to unite. So um you can use a little plate on the dorsum from the capitate it's almost like a little spider plate um to try and get that to unite and consider a, a proximal row carpectomy um was what were my initial thoughts so remove the scaphoid and the triquetrum and then just let it articulate on that capitate head which would probably give him a, a functional range of motion uh, from there um from that side uh, that that are pretty. I probably would have used two small headless screws to fix the capitate, and and done a proximal row carpectomy. I think that would have been my, uh, uh, pro probably the, be the thing that I would have tried. I mean, if you can do a capitate extension osteotomy and get it to unite, then that's a good alternative solution. Yeah. Um, and a radio cap, yeah, uh, a scaphoid capitate fusion. Uh, would be a, another option. Yeah, it depends which is the yes, best. Yes, you could do that. Yeah. You could yeah. do that. That would maintain the height. Um, it would maintain the height. It would mean so, you probably wouldn't have to worry about the triquetrum. It also means that it depends on the articular surface for the capitate. If, if yes. that's problematic, then actually that's a very good option. Yeah, it's like a kimbok. Yeah. Yeah. So we try to uh, length the capitate and put some uh, graft here. You can see here in this mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But it, if it unites, that, that will be a very good solution. Yeah. If it doesn't work, you have a yeah. plan B with the, with the split point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's... Uh, interesting case because he applied to me with just this x-ray and uh, we need to figure mm -hmm. out what what's going on in the, in the wrist and yeah. only then uh, he 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 showed after a few days he had his first x-ray and this CT scan that uh, showed us that it's um, it, Very interesting. It, this, uh, if you need, if you end up needing to do, um, uh, well, the trouble with the scaphoid capitate fusion is that if he has a non-union of the capitate, that's going to be difficult. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, memory staples are cheap, easy, and actually, uh, I found them to be the most reliable way of getting carpal bones to join to each other. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Good. Well, I think um, with you in the dark, Andre, we will uh, probably bid you farewell for, for, for this evening. So, uh, Ed, thank you very much for uh, a very clear and comprehensive talk, um, which has provoked uh, some... some uh, some good questions. So I think the discussion was good. Um,
And uh, I think um, we have a plan for uh, a webinar in April, probably the 13th of April, uh, yeah. with Nick Riley, um, a consultant from the Regional Bone Infection Centre in Oxford, is going to talk to us about uh, acute and chronic infections in the hand and upper limb and their management. Um, and uh, uh, he, uh, he has a lot of experience uh, and gives a very good talk on that. So uh, I hope that uh, you'll all be able to join us uh, then. Uh, we've had a, a, a good number of attendees this evening and a, some great questions. So thank you for that. Um, uh, Andre, um, Slava Ukraini. Heroem Slava. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Edward, very much. Thank you, Pierre Luigi, and uh, all of our attendees to join us today. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Bye bye. bye.